Um, this is Adi um, from Coiled, um, VP Marketing. Um, and this is a fantastic story for us, a Dask story that we always like to tell, and a financial services story, which um, is very close to my heart, uh, being in financial services um, for many years. Um, so I'm going to hand off to Kumar from Kuber, and of course, Howard is going to join us from Capital Logics. But before that, I just want to let you know two things. One, um, if you uh, want to send us any questions, uh, please do so in that um, chat box. I'll send a, a quick note in a second. And this um, is recorded, and we're going to uh, send you the recording this afternoon by email. Um, so uh, Kumar, let me hand off to you. Thanks, Adi. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, all. This is Kumar Metapali, CEO of uh, Kuber Systems. Uh, just as a brief background, where we come from, uh, I come from a quant uh, background in terms of uh, working at Wellington and uh, Putnam Investment Quant teams. And we started Kuber focused on data management and analytics since 2001. And I'm uh, so thankful to Adi and the COIL team for sponsoring the session. And I'm also thankful to uh, my client, my friend, my partner, Howard Getston from uh, CapLogix. Um, and I will let actually uh, Howard actually introduce himself. Um, I'm sure he'll have, uh, uh, he can do a much better job than I can. Howard, all yours, please. Thanks. Uh, my name is Howard Getz, and I'm the CEO of Capital Logics. Uh, we run a data science company that specializes in creating an insight engine or the tools that would help run a hedge fund. Um, and then we also run some hedge funds based on that. Uh, but basically, uh, I'm somebody that's trying to focus on the concept of amplified intelligence, uh, making better decisions, taking smart, smarter actions, and finding, finding a way to continually raise the bar. And it, and it means consuming a whole lot of data, making a lot of uh, computations in real time, and trying to use that as the raw material and feedback loops uh, for an improving system of uh, decision analytics and and orders, so it's uh, it, it it was terrific to meet uh, Kumar and the team at Kuber. Uh, we actually outsource a, a big portion of what we used to do internally to them. Uh, it turns out, sixty to seventy percent of any data science project uh, is probably spent on data, and we were spending millions of dollars a year being okay at data. Uh, we were excellent at the data science on what you do with it once you have it, but how do you ingest it, clean it, get it in the right place, um, and, and make it available programmatically so that uh, it becomes part of the process rather than a whole separate process or a silo of expertise. And so that's what uh, Kuber does for us. Uh, and it turns out that Dask, um, and coiled has been an important part of the solution as well uh, by being able to kind of use Python at scale in real time. So uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk and Kumar, I'll throw it back to you. Thank you, Howard. So uh, this is uh, for everyone's benefit. Uh, I think this is a quick rundown on what we're going to cover. Uh, obviously, you know, we always start with the problems that, uh, you know, Harvard and team were facing at CapLogix, CapLogix. And uh, based on their needs, the valuations that we had done in terms of, uh, you know, what is available for us to actually solve his problem set um, and ultimately how actually DAS came about and uh, the, the benefits that we got out of the platform. So that's how the presentation is gonna go. And we'll try to wrap it up a little early so that you do have time to ask us any questions that you may have um, so that, uh, you know, our intention is to kind of share our experiences, uh, our, uh, you know, path to getting into the right solution. I hope you will find it interesting, I know. There are multiple ways of solving uh, this kind of complex problem sets, but uh, we found this to be extremely useful and we wanted to collectively share with you all. So um, Mark, next slide, please. So as we look into this, uh, 
uh, you know, when we got in uh, with uh, Capital Logics, um, internally at the time, what we had was a massively proprietary hardware software platform uh, with tremendous amount of capacity, um, you know, 126 physical CPUs with about one and a half terabytes of memory. And what it was very good at was it was able to process the data uh, extremely fast. Uh, just because uh, the data was very close, as close to the compute as possible. As we all know, that is a critical bottleneck threshold one has to solve. Uh, as and when, if you have to fetch the data from the database, obviously there is a, you know latency gaps in terms of how fast you can get the data to the processing uh, CPUs. So this system was very well suited, but um, unfortunately, the cost per run in terms of, um, you know, uh, that the capital logic was facing and the other problems that we're going to discuss in the next slide, those were the limiting factors. So if we actually look into uh, these problems uh, in a modular fashion, uh, Mark, next slide, please. Um, so the first one was this proprietoriness of the box was limiting in terms of your ability to add new software libraries. Obviously, data scientists would like to experiment. The more they experiment, the better it is. And obviously, the more experimentation means, the more libraries that they want to use um, offhand. And that was a big, big limitation factor. And also, the database that is behind the box in terms of scalability, in terms of accessibility, and in terms of uh, you know uh, multiple updates and parallel concurrency issues, those were some of the problems that were happening more on the technical side of it. If you're linking to the problem number two side, uh, which is the second module, what you will notice, uh, Mark, um, what you'll notice actually, this is I'll let my you know kind of uh, Howard expound on this a little bit better. Uh, you know, in terms of um, special technical skill sets that are needed to support the platform, whether it is not, it's hard to find, uh, which is, you know, uh, as Howard says, maximizing genius level talent, I will let him expand on that. But more in terms of the specialized technical skill set that is hard to get. And if it's hard to get, then you spend so much of effort and time kind of training these resources to come up to speed. And obviously you have the attrition that you have to deal with at some point. Um, and it's hard to lose someone who has been trained. So these were a, a big, um, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, roadblocks. Uh, how would you want to share something on um, uh, maximizing the genius level uh, talent, yeah. please? Sure. Um, Kumar is a technical, um, executive so kumar understands people and process uh, but is very analytical and focused on how you actually do something uh, i'm a different kind of executive i'm i'm focused on possibility um and and in a sense setting vision and finding talent resources and opportunity and I find that it's easier to predict human nature than specific technologies. Um, technology solutions are going to change. Now, you can know that something like Python is catching on and that you want to scale it. But on the other hand, you can't tell which libraries you're going to want or need um, or, or the specific skill sets you're going to want. When we had a proprietary hardware platform and uh, a closed system that wanted to keep you within the system, uh, I couldn't hire for culture. I couldn't hire for temperament. I, I, in a sense, had to try to find some people who already had some familiarity with that. But on the other hand, um, it also was the biggest constraint. There's a, a concept called constraint theory in business that says maximum throughput, the most you can get out of something is not hard to calculate. You don't have to think about all the buffers and, and linear planning and container optimization or any of that. Uh, it comes down to the smallest constraint, whatever limits your input and output the most, that bottleneck defines the maximum throughput. And it turned out that uh, talent 
was one of the major bottlenecks we had. And part of it was people didn't like being stuck in this proprietary system. They thought it was limiting their career. And as they were looking for increased flexibility, they wanted to, to go where the momentum was going. Uh, there's structured data, there's unstructured data, but in a sense, they, they wanted open systems and open source platforms that, that made them feel that they were free to focus on solving the solution rather than conforming to something. And the truth is, once we eliminated that pain, it reminded me of something my dad said, it feels so good when you take the sharp stick out of your eye. Um, data scientists could focus on being data scientists. Uh, they could focus on things that mattered to them. And, and as you start to use technology and innovation to do things at better scale, it frees the human. And in a sense, you wanna free them to focus on the things that add the most value uh, to the organization, to the stakeholders, but also to themselves. And so part of it is it, it frees you to be a better leader by helping them figure out what they want and what they can do to achieve it rather than how to make the hardware or software do something that it wasn't intended to do. All right, <laughs> Kumar. Thank, thank you. And then obviously the other uh, major uh, issue was, as Howard mentioned in the beginning, it was amount of time that has being, uh, being spent by the data scientists in terms of corralling the data, cleaning the data versus what their focus should be in terms of building the algorithms that they wanted to build. So this is about, you know, it's one of Howardisms, which is let hunters hunt and let farmers farm, right? So that is uh, essentially how do you uh, set up a system that easily scales across the team so that they have more opportunities to actually hunt for opportunities than actually dealing with the day-to-day -day issues. So that is, uh, you know, um, uh, one of the key criteria. So to summarize all of this, what you know, they've got, we've come up with about eight uh, serious or uh, eight serious challenges that we wanted to address uh, from a capital logics efficiencies perspective. You know, these are listed out. Uh, you know, as you can see, it's collaboration is a big thing. Reducing the support cost is a big thing. Um, in terms of uh, you know abstracting out SQL because you don't want to be based on the based on the current experience of being locked into a database, they wanted to abstract the SQL layer out so that the coins can actually build algorithms even if a firm from a technical perspective, it decides to change the underlying database platform. And also minimizing the conflict in terms of between the research and the production areas where it is so often that, you know, for research purposes, you may need more data, but for production, you may need a lesser amount of data because you've done all the back tests that you want to do and such, but at the same time, the migration between the platforms has to be absolutely seamless, both from a data perspective as well as coding perspective. These are some of the technical challenges. And of course, finally, uh, to provide the massive parallelism that is required to run anything, uh, essentially we are working with a window of about an hour by which time we had to run an end-to-end uh, -end process uh, on a production basis. So these were all the challenges that needed to be addressed. So the first foray for us in terms of helping uh, Capital Logics was to introduce uh, QDPI, which stands for Quantitative Techniques in Python. What QDPI allows us uh, firms to do is kind of do this data virtualization so that you can get the SQL abstraction it empowers teams to collaborate uh, with a single source code control seamlessly through APIs, so you don't have to open up different windows. So it brings about all these efficiencies into the picture. So once we added this QDPI, one of the main benefits to Howard's team is to actually look for more opportunities, build more algorithms, be contained within the confines of team collaboration, not starting something from scratch. So those are the things that QDPI could do. So in the next slide, so if you go back to the eight things that we listed out, we were able to pretty much uh, answer um, uh, in all of these eight, the first seven we were able to answer in terms of the QDPI, the collaboration techniques and such. Mark uh, the next slide, please. The next one. 
right? So the one thing that gap that still, the previous slide, please. Yeah. So the one thing that we could actually uh, couldn't address as a gap is to provide the massive parallelism that is required to run these AI algorithms. We kind of addressed in terms of these temporary tables, you know, if you think, think about a path of mining, it goes through a sequence of steps. And for each step, once it is done, you have to store the data in a temporary table. All of those were taken care of by QDPI, but we are still left with, you know, how do we leverage the massive parallelism that the proprietary box has given and what options are there to actually enable while giving the users the flexibility in terms of, uh, you know, bringing their own libraries, uh, you know, as well as, uh, you know, native pandas and such. So we started looking into solutions. Obviously the first solution that we looked into was Snowflake. This is obvious, a tremendous trends in terms of, uh, you know, acquiring third-party data, you know, uh, you know, obviously scalable to a great extent. But one of the major gaps that we found uh, that couldn't satisfy our last requirement was it only supports JavaScripts and Java UDTFs. Whereas, uh, you know, if the quants do really want to use these native Python libraries and scikit-learns and such, that was a limiting factor. So quickly Snowflake uh, obviously wasn't the choice for us. Then we started looking into two Apache Spark. Obviously everyone uses this. Uh, again, for Apache Spark, um, um, at the time, the, the, the major, again, the, the gap was in its ability to support the native Python libraries. You have to go through hoops, you have your own channel to kind of support these algorithms. So that was, again, uh, not uh, the ideal solution, though it was getting closer, it wasn't there yet. So finally, we uh, looked into Dask, and that is where uh, you know, it is obviously Dask is not, it is still growing in popularity. It is not as widespread as, um, you know, something like uh, Spark, but most importantly, it gives us the native uh, support to the native Python libraries, and it gives us the flexibility in terms of fonts to write the UDTFs that they need to a full complete extent. So that is, what uh, we went with in terms of um, uh, a comprehensive solution. So if you look into the overall big picture as to how the problem is solved, um, uh, you know, the QDPI stays as an interface between the quants and the data that they want to uh, access uh, using the, the data abstractions, virtualizations, team collaborations, and with the common data model, everything is contained within classes that actually get submitted, whether you're writing a complex algorithm or a simple algorithm, that everything is contained within the QDPI layer. And what we had done uh, with the help from COIL and uh, A is to actually implement APIs that seamlessly connects the Dask environment, the Dask layer with QDPI. So when uh, quants are writing the algorithms, they don't have to worry about how do I set up a cloud, how do I start a cluster, how many workers, et cetera, et cetera. They should, uh, they should be able to quickly bring about a template and say, now run this uh, UDTF, uh, UDF in the Dask layer. So it is quite seamless and um, you know, uh, tremendously scalable. Today, I think we are running about 196, um, uh, no, 196 CPUs uh, across four or five, um, you know, EC2 instances uh, in AWS. Uh, obviously, that is one uh, tremendous advantage that, you know, obviously, when you move to a cloud environment that you automatically get that uh, flexibility. And for the database uh, side of it, uh, we are using Redshift uh, from Amazon, again, um, based on the database requirements and the data virtualization that QDPI kind of supports, Redshift is more than satis uh, you know, satisfactory, if not excels in terms of what we are trying to do. So uh, once this was set up, obviously the proof is in the pudding, um, you know, uh, why, uh, you know, someone like uh, visionary like Harvard gets excited is he sees the results in terms of, you know, of, uh, comparing before and after. There is a 97% reduction in costs uh, per run and uh, as well as on an annual basis. 
So uh, if you were to think uh, in terms of number of simulations that you're running uh, per week, the cost per run uh, drops from 290 bucks, I run to about $4, uh, approximately $5 um, uh, per run and such. And if you were to keep the cost the same, it's about, you know, one can run about 670 simulations, et cetera. So Kumar, oh, let me just interject just... here. So it's 50% it's, uh, faster and only 3% of the cost. Now, to me, that doesn't mean uh, I want to do it faster and stop. Uh, what it means is I say, look, if the goal is exponential results, uh, the way to do it is to find more competitive advantages. So that means more ways to win. It means more testing. It means going through a lot of trash to find the treasure, right? There's signal and noise. But you take this concept of exponential results and the concept that says, look, there's three key drivers. One is the competitive advantage or more ways to win. The second is the strategic certainty or, or a way to have enough sensors or feedback loops to track. It means I need access to data faster and better. And then you wanna be able to take that data and use it to compound the insights or do more. So this 97% reduction in cost means that I can do 30 times the amount of testing or, or things to, to get a higher level of performance. It means amplifying intelligence by making better decisions, automating more smart actions and spending time raising the bar and continuing to, to shoot for better performance because I'm no longer coming from a scarcity mindset of how do I finish this mind-numbingly complex series of tasks within an hour to all of a sudden, not only can I do it in way less than enough time, it's cheap enough that in a sense, compute becomes virtually free and I can do it in a massively parallel way to be able to say, and now I can look at a, a whole layer of insights above what we were doing. Uh, the bottom line is this changes the economics of the business. It's not just a technology solution. It changes what's possible and what you want to do. Thank you, Howard. That's very well put. So that's the, you know, that's the success story here. Uh, it, it's about, you know, one of the um, um, things that as data scientists, one has to think about is when you get started, you're okay with the environment that you have, but you will hit as you try to scale up, as you look, try to look for more opportunities, an ideal um, uh, infrastructure setup that you need to have to really scale and get to that level. And these are the things that you will come. How do I access the data? How do I make it easier? How do I uh, you know, enhance the collaboration? How do I get the parallelism? I hope the story that we just shared with you answers some of those questions. Uh, I'm sure there is multiple ways of doing it. We found this to be the most optimal solution and we are glad to be here and glad to have shared that. Howard, thank you so much. Um, and uh, we'll open it up for any questions. Yeah, again, this is uh, Mark DeFry chiming in. If you've got any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, I do have one here, it's a directed for Howard, and it's about, um, fr from your position leading the firm, what are the, what are the things that you're measuring uh, and what are you focusing on to run the business the way that, that you've chosen to run it? So um, I, I look at a longer time frame than a lot of people. Uh, and, and so I look at stages and stage one, it's, uh, does it help me do what I already do, but better? Uh, and a way to figure that out is to have some key metrics, things like efficiency, effectiveness, or certainty, right? Am I getting uh, more work done with less time or less effort? Um, and can I win with a higher degree of certainty? Um, but that's only the beginning, really, you then have to say, but what, what does it make possible? Instead of how do I do what I've already done? It's how is this capability going to allow me to prototype something that's valuable for the future? What product, service, or offering is that going to make possible for me as we continue to improve? 
And ultimately, where is the platform going? What am I going to want to build upon these capabilities that I never thought of from before? And what we're really talking about is exponential thinking that, to create exponential results. And in an exponential company, one of the most important numbers to know is the time to double your capacity. If you think about Moore's law or things like that, it's, it's a very similar concept. But one of the things I'm looking at internally is how long does it take me to double our capabilities? And some of that's gonna be used for better performance. Some of that is gonna be uh, for less volatility. Some of that is gonna be to improve the quality of life for the employees or stakeholders. But the concept is starting to understand some of these clever measures really helps you know whether you're getting what you want the way you wanna get it. Uh, Kumar? That, that's, I, you know, I can't agree more. It, it, it is about the vision and when you have the vision how do you actually uh, uh, you know modularize it to actually get to um, um, it doing more things faster it is not about cost savings as much as it's actually exploring getting to more things faster and uh, that's you know, how i see as you say that, Kumar, I, I recognize that there's actually another important measure, and it's sometimes energy is the most important thing to measure. There are some things that make you strong and other things that make you weak, and one of the reasons that we've liked partnering with you is that the team actually enjoys what they're doing. The, the team is excited about the insights you bring and the capabilities you bring, but also about what it frees them to do. So I, I think part of what you have to do is think about as you make a technology decision, on one hand, it's great if it saves time or money, but what does it do to the mindset of the employee? And does it increase your likelihood of being able to recruit, retain, and evolve or ascend the level of talent that you have in the organization. That's correct. Thank you. Very well said, Mark. So, uh, I mean, Albert. So Kumar, we have another question here that's a little bit more technical in nature. I'm going to assume you might want to tackle this one. It, the question is, why did you move from on-prem to cloud? Did you benchmark utilizing Dask on-prem prior to that? Or was there some other reason? Um, based on the on-prem hardware, uh, it won't support Dask because again, it's a proprietary library and such. So there was no chance for us to actually uh, experiment that on the on-prem hardware box. Number two, obviously, if you can't use that on-prem massive uh, box, your choices are to actually set up the clusters in-house, which is, uh, you know, a big no-no uh, at this, uh, you know, uh, at this stage actually for any firm to do because the cloud offers you that flexibility. So the natural choice was to actually experiment that with the cloud, bring the service up, bring the service down, cluster up, cluster down. So those are the benefits that one could get easily from a cloud environment. That was a natural choice. That was a no brainer. Got it. Uh, a, a, perhaps a follow-up to that, I'm gonna combine a couple of questions that I see, which has to do with time. You know, How long did it take to accomplish the move uh, to the environment that you described at the end. And then I guess I can combine that with what new workloads or, or things does that open up that perhaps weren't available if you didn't cover it already? So uh, I think, you know, this is something that I will let Howard uh, chime in as well. Um, the the uh, One of the things uh, that, you know, Howard, can you help me out? Probably you can phrase it and I'll collect my thoughts too. So are, are you asking how much time did it take? I think well, the question is that how long did it take to migrate from the original environment to this new environment that was described, Kumar? So, so, you know, so the saying. answer is from the beginning of the project where they had no concept that they were going to use Coiled or Dask to to where we are now, I think was less than six months, but it's, it's not really an accurate depiction of how long it took uh, because in the beginning of a project, two companies have to start to understand what, uh, what the unique abilities or, or the, the, the things that you have superior skill that gives you energy are. And so in the beginning, uh, we were looking at Kumar's team 
primarily for cutie pie. We didn't think about outsourcing some of the actual um, data ingestion, validation, management. We didn't think about having them convert our code into a form that works with their platform. Uh, we didn't anticipate a lot of this. And so it, it morphed and migrated along the way still to, to get this to where we are in six months is uh, incredibly impressive because frankly, in most of our uh, pioneering tech efforts, uh, we get a lot of arrows in our back and, and, and blood on the floor. And it costs a lot of time and money and productivity goes down before it goes up. Uh, here, we were able to see a cost savings and a productivity increase uh, very quickly. And it actually helped fuel the motivation that let us go after bigger and better things. I think the scope and scale of the project has um, shifted bigger, um, but, but that bigger future vision is modularized. So what we see is a series of small attainable steps rather than a big unknown. Kumar? Yeah, absolutely. In terms of the second question, in terms of what are the next steps, I mean, it's hard to catch up with what data scientists want to do. Uh, the list keeps growing every day. Uh, the vision uh, that Capital Logics has uh, in terms of just to give you a scale for it, uh, it, we are not talking about tens of fifteens of algorithms, but we are talking talking about hundreds or uh, hundreds to thousands of algorithms that they want to write and experiment to actually mine the data sets. Right, so uh, that is the scale that we are looking at, and the platform, the solution is very well suited to address that because it's about uh, you know the concepts that and the vision that Harvard has in terms of. How do you look for, you know, what algorithm works for what market conditions to be able to quickly analyze that and get to the answers? That's yeah. what we are after. But Kumar, a, a different way to recontextualize what you just said is that uh, there are a number of ways to create a competitive advantage. And in data science, uh, one form of thinking is called combinatorial thinking. It's where uh, you get variations or, on a theme or you take an algorithm and you apply it to more markets or more timeframes and you, you, in a sense, get more granular or precise data. But really, if you're using the same information and the same process as other people, it's hard to have a competitive advantage. Part of the way to have a competitive advantage uh, is to be able to do things on a different scale or from a di different uh, perspective. And so, the, uh, in a sense, dimensionality becomes important. And, and this platform and our partnership with you actually helped us create more ways to win both combinatorially by creating more and more things that we could do, more algorithms on more precise uh, uh, amounts of data markets or timeframes, but also the freedom to use that compute power and, and the feedback loops to look at different data and different processes to, to create a bigger and more sustainable competitive advantage. And I think it's really important not just to think about how does this help us do things based on the mindset we had going in, but how do you have a growth mindset to continue to think about what this makes possible? And of those possibilities, if I say, here's where I am and here's where I want to go, based on the possibility I choose, I may choose a different path to get there rather than simply the thing that's the most logical step from where I am. So the best next step isn't necessarily the most efficient or effective move from where I am, it's the most efficient, effective, or certain move towards where I want to go. I think that's, uh, that's very well put, Howard. I think it's a great place for us to tie off. Um, we've had, uh, for those of you that are still on, uh, there's a couple of other hanging questions, but I think you'll find um, when you play back, you'll hear a couple of those areas addressed in some depth that will probably satisfy what you're looking for. But with that, I want to thank you both, Kumar and Howard, for your time and for your depth on this, sharing the story. And of course, thank you to the folks at Coiled for sponsoring this event. Like, like we mentioned at the beginning, you will all get a link to the recording so you can listen back and check in. And uh, 
Of course, if you have any follow-up questions or anything you'd like to dig into, you see Kumar's email here and our website. Thank you all again. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. And uh, finally, if we don't, if you haven't answered any questions, we will compile the questions and we'll send out an email to you individually answering those questions. Thank you.